Okay, hello. Uh, and I know people are watching the videos on YouTube. And I also have one person here on Zoom so far. So I will start lecturing. Um, so this is the last lecture. So obviously we've arrived at the end of the part of the book we're reading, right? The part of the book we're reading is the Doctrine of Elements. I'll write this up. Last time. And finished the Transcendental Aesthetic a long time ago. The Transcendental Logic has two main parts, the analytic and the dialectic. The dialectic has two parts, the concepts of the pure reason and I think I keep calling this the inferences, dialectical inferences of pure reason. I think maybe the title is something like the procedure of pure reason and its dialectical inferences, or I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to call it inferences. And that has three parts. And the three parts are the paralogisms and the antinomy and the ideal. Oh, what else? And um, um, there's also an appendix to the Transcendental Dialectic. We're not reading that. Uh, um, and uh, there's some other stuff at the end of the inferences part about the regulatory function of the ideas. That's really important, but we're not reading that either. Um, but uh, Right, and then after that, there's the doctrine of the method that we're not reading. Some years when I teach this course, I do one part of the doctrine of the method, which is what's called the canon of pure reasoning. And the canon of pure reason is kind of the transition to Kant's practical philosophy. So if I had one more lecture, I would do that, but I don't. So, um, so uh, this is the second lecture on the ideal. The first one on Tuesday was, I think, about the actual transcendental illusion that's specific to the ideal. So that is, um, I think, in, in effect, we've already finished all three of these parts. But the ideal has this other part, which I start started talking about last time, which is about proofs of the existence of God. Um, and as I said towards the end last time, it seems like uh, proofs of the existence of God, um, which, so the theoretical or speculative proofs of the existence of God, right? Remember, distinction between practical and theoretical. Practical questions are questions about what you should do, whereas uh, theoretical questions are questions about what is or something like that. So uh, um, the critique of pure reason is belongs to Kant's theoretical philosophy, right? It's about the possibility of knowledge. Um, uh, Whereas Kant's practical philosophy is about ethics. So, um, so in the Critique of Pure Reason, he's talking about the theoretical or speculative proofs of the existence of God. That is, the proofs of existence of God that try to show uh, like why based on the type of knowledge we have, we can conclude that God exists, something like that. Whereas um, in the practical philosophy, Kant has a practical proof of the existence of God, um, which, I mean, he briefly alludes to it here, actually, um, 
which, you know, starts from the fact that we lie under certain obligations. And then uh, from that, um, I should turn this on. Um, uh, from that derives the fact that for practical purposes, we must, that is for purposes of deciding what to do, we must believe that a certain God in a certain sense exists. So, um, right. And remember in the like, way back in the preface, he was, he was already talking about how the reason he needs to limit theoretical, the theoretical employment of reason is to leave room for the practical employment of reason. Um, and so like, that's part of what's going on here. He's trying to show that all these theoretical or speculative proofs. So by the way, the reason I say that these equal each other is that, uh, the, right, the Latin verb specula speculare was used to, is traditionally been used to translate the Greek verb theorain. Right, so like um, uh, theoria, the Greek word theoria is translated as into Latin as speculatio. So these should be completely equivalent. Sometimes Kant uses speculative, seems to use it in a more restricted sense, where it's only like the attempted transcendent use of the theoretical faculties that he calls speculative. And there it comes closer to the way we use speculative nowadays to mean kind of like guessing or something like that. Uh, but uh, although, of course, we're not talking about guesses here either, but it's like, you know, not unsubstantiated knowledge claims or something. But like, but I think usually he uses speculative as you should in a technical context as just the equivalent of theoretical. All right. So sorry for that digression. So the um, he's trying to show that none of these theoretical proofs of the existence of God will work. Um, and that's in part because he wants to, although he doesn't say this here exactly, but they don't prove exactly the right thing that we need for ethics. So it's actually good that they don't work. Um, the practical proof proves the right thing, basically. Um, um, okay, so what do these proofs prove? Well, so they don't prove anything that has any clear relationship to ethics, nor do they prove anything that has any clear relationship to religion in the sense of like human religious institutions. Um cultural or political institutions, um, nor do they prove anything that has any obvious connection to, let's say, stories in the Bible. Um, and in fact, when we talk about God from this point of view in philosophy, like the reason philosophers always talk about this is not so much because of anything about the Bible or Christianity or Judaism or Islam, or it's it was Plato and Aristotle talk about this about theology, right? So, um, you know, like it starts with pagan philosophy. <laughs> um, um, so anyway, without trying to get into the history there, the main point I wanna say is what we're trying to prove here is the existence of an infinitely perfect being, which in some way is an infinitely perfect being, which in some way is the condition for the existence of everything else. Right, in some way, everything else only ex only can exist because this infinitely perfect being exists. That's what we're trying to prove. Um, so, um, and that's what Kant thinks we're not gonna be able to prove using these methods. Um, so, I mean, Kant says that there's three different possible ways of going about proving this, you know, there's this, um, of which I only assigned 
two, uh, although not because the other one isn't important, but because there isn't, again, there isn't enough time to, to read everything. Um, and I think, I guess I would say like the most um, characteristically Kantian arguments are in his responses to the first two and not the third one. So um, the, the three proof types of proof are called, and these are Kant's terms, which are still used now. Uh, but Kant was the one, I believe, who first classified the arguments this way and introduced this terminology. Right, they're called the ontological proof, the cosmological truth proof, and the um, physico theological proof. So the physio theological proof, which is the one I didn't assign the response to, is. Um, uh, is or includes everything that you would call an argument from design, Ray. Right? It basically like looks at, and by the way, why is it called physical theological? So, uh, you know, again, translation equivalence between Greek and Latin, phusis is the translation of, or natura is the translation of phusis. So this means natural theological proof. The proof that the kind of proof you give in what's called natural theology. So natural theology, at least the way Kant is understanding it, means that. I mean, this that's not really what it means, but that's that's how Kant apparently is understanding it. That natural theology means that you look at nature and conclude from the way nature is that uh, it has an infinitely perfect cause. Um. And, you know, so like you start obviously by noticing that things are adapted to each other or somehow seem to be designed in a certain way. And remember, this is before Darwin. So uh, there isn't any obvious way to explain that, except uh, it actually was designed. Now, I mean, even just going that far, Kant doesn't think that the proof works. You wouldn't necessarily know that from his discussion here, but from what's called the third critique, the critique of judgment, it's clear that Kant thinks that even there, we aren't entitled, entitled to conclude that there actually is a designer. Um, and, you know, even without Darwin's alternative explanation, which he doesn't know about and doesn't consider, he already thinks that the argument from design doesn't work. But in this context, it's actually easier to show that it doesn't work because, you know, we're trying to get an infinitely perfect being. And of course, we only ever observe finite evidence of design in the world, right? And we can never conclude to the infinite goodness and wisdom, let alone the infinite reality in every respect of the cause of the world in this manner. So, so like, what Kant says actually happens when people carry out this proof is that they go up to a certain point with this proof, and that the point they go to would only be sufficient to show that the world has like a very wise and good cause or something like that. And then they somehow like illegitimately smuggle in this proof without noticing themselves even that they're doing it basically. Um, and so as he puts it, they leap off their natural theology, they leap over the gap and they introduce the cosmological proof to, um, to get to their the, the conclusion they desire that an infinitely perfect being is, is the ground of existence of the world. And moreover, as you, as you can see in our reading, Kant says that the cosmological proof really also smuggles in the ontological proof. So he says that really this proof, ontological proof, is like lying hidden in every speculative proof of the existence of God. Um, how we, uh, well, I guess, okay, so I should say what the other two types of proof are. So the cosmological proof, I think, is the kind that in the reading for last time, he said is natural procedure of reason here. Um, 
it's basically Descartes' preferred meditation. Right, there are two proofs of the existence of God in the meditations. Well, there may be three, depending on how you read the third meditation, whether there's, there may be two different proofs in the third meditation. But in any case, there's two different types of proofs in the Descartes meditations. One is found in the third meditation, a different one is found in the fifth meditation. The fifth meditation proof is the ontological proof. Um, so, but um, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But how does a cosmological proof work? Well, um, 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 Okay, so I'm going to read from something from the book. This is B616, and that's on page 498 in the Kemp Smith translation. So now. Switch camera on. No. There we go. Okay. So first, this is how it works. Oops. First, from any given existence, it may be merely my own existence. So, Ray, I mean, that's that's the clue that he's thinking about Descartes' version in particular. Of course, in the meditations, since at the beginning of the third meditation, the meditator has only proved their own existence. Uh, the proof can only be like starting from my own existence. That's all I have to go on. All right. So anyway, first, that from any given existence, it may be merely my own existence. We can correctly infer the existence of an unconditionally necessary being. Secondly, that we must regard a being which contains all reality and therefore every condition as being absolutely unconditioned. And in this concept of the an ens realissimum, we have therefore found the concept of a thing to which we can also ascribe absolute necessity. So, um, this is the way Kant is understanding the cosmological proof. It has two steps. The first step really comes from the antinomy. Now, I said last time it's from the fourth antinomy, and I still think that's right. Although when I, I noticed that when Kant talks about it in this section, he keeps making it sound like it has to do with the third antinomy of cause and effect. It's hard to understand the difference between those two anyway, and I don't think it matters for present purposes. Um, although it probably does matter for understanding how the different parts of Kant's system fit together. But in any case, they, remember the antinomies are about from the existence of the conditioned, we conclude the existence of the unconditioned. So uh, like in particular, the fourth antinomy is from the existence of the contingent, we infer the existence of the absolutely necessary. Or in the third antinomy version, from the existence of the um, effect, we conclude the existence of an absolute cause, an uncaused cause. So, um, right, so the cosmological proof starts by saying, suppose something exists. And on the side, we say, and this is the way Kant puts it in another part of the same section, but I at least exist, right? So like, uh, um, so something does exist. <laughs> so 
um, like either that thing that exists is absolutely necessary, meaning it couldn't not exist. It would be a contradiction for it not to exist. Well, actually, maybe I shouldn't bring in contradiction yet, but whatever. It's impossible for it not to exist. In that case, like we finished this step. We found something that exists necessarily. But if it's not, then it's contingent, right? Meaning it could exist or it could not exist. So there must be a condition right? Like there must be a reason or ground due to which it exists rather than not existing. So, so now we've proved that something else exists and now you repeat the same thing. Either that thing exists necessarily or that new thing is contingent. And then you say, and I mean, this is the argument for the thesis, obviously, not for the antithesis. Um, Kant doesn't exactly explain why. Um, it's the thesis that necess that naturally gets brought in here at this point in the ideal and not the antithesis. But the thesis argument says, and there can't be an infinite regress, right? So we must at some point get to something that is necessary. Right. If you think of it in terms of cause and effect, maybe it's easier to understand, right? Like whatever exists, every contingent thing that exists must have a cause. And that cause, if the cause is itself contingent, it must have a cause, so on and so forth. And again, the thesis says, and we must eventually get to an uncaused cause, a necessary cause that must act and therefore must exist. Right, so that's step one. So the cosmological proof has two steps. Step one um, there is an absolutely necessary being. Now, that's already a mistake, right? I mean, sometimes in this section, Kant talks about it in such a way that it seems like he's losing track of the fact that it's a mistake, right? Because he's often speaking in the voice of someone who's making this argument. But, um, you know, once in a while, I think he reminds you, by the way, this step here is already a mistake, right? That's one of the dialectical arguments in the antinomy. It's the argument for the thesis, basically. So, uh, but in any case, um, this argument by itself hasn't proved what we're looking for, right? It hasn't proved that an absolutely perfect, infinitely perfect being exists. All we know about this being we've proved the existence of is that it's necessary. It must exist. But who knows what it's like? So, I mean, Kant says, basically, that's the right answer. We have no idea what characteristics something could have that would make it necessary for that thing to exist, impossible for it not to exist. What mysterious quality could it have? This is the way Hume's uh, characters put it in the dialogues concerning natural religion when they discuss the same proof. You know, uh, like what mysterious quality could something have that would make it impossible for it not to exist? And the, the answer is, so the real answer is, I think, according to Hume and Kant, we have we could we can't conceive of such a quality that doesn't even make sense. So um, but here we think thinking that this proof has gone through, we think so, like, we must be able to conceive of the existence of this thing because we've just proved <laughs> that it exists. So now, as Kant puts it, if we look around in our concepts to find one that is, sorry, I just lost focus here. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, 
we look around in our concepts to try to find one that would be appropriate for this idea of absolute necessity. And so, um, and we find that the concept of an ens realissimum is the only one that works. Right, so step two is the argument that shows that this absolutely necessary, I know this is totally illegible. This is supposed to say N E C short for necessary, right? So the we know that this absolutely necessary being exists. That's step one. And step two is an absolutely necessary being. What could it be like? It has to be an ens realissimum. So we put those two together and we have a proof of what we wanted to prove, namely that an infinitely perfect being exists. I guess also, like I said, I keep kind of throwing this in as an afterthought, but uh, it's important. Um, namely that in some way, this infinitely perfect being is the ground of possibility of everything else. Um, like here in the cosmological proof, it needs it looks like we need this step to say that. But in the ontological proof where we don't have this step, I think um, it turns out we don't need that step to say it. We just need what we already said in the ideal proper, namely that every individual thing is possible only as a limitation of the absolute possibility of the ens realissimum. So, I mean, that like that gives a different idea of the sense in which God is the ground of the world or something like that. But uh, but apparently either one of those is good enough <laughs> for transcendental theology. Right. So anyway, so that's how the cosmological proof is supposed to work. And if you look into in the third meditation, you'll see that there is a proof that um, is kind of like that that uh, um, basically shows that I exist and yet I'm an imperfect being that couldn't have caused myself to exist and therefore I must have another cause. And, you know, and then that if that cause itself is imperfect, it must have a cause, but there can't be an infinite regress. Therefore, there must be a perfect uh, um, cause. Um So that's the cosmological proof. So, and Kant is going to say this step, even if step one works, which it doesn't, step two would be illegitimate, <laughs> right? So there's another mistake in step two. Actually, like there's lots of mistakes here. I talked about some of the others last time and Kant at some point says that it's like as if dialectical reason had kind of like pulled out all the stops, like threw in every mistake you could possibly make in order to get this conclusion. But, um, but uh, the mistake here, um, um, Kant says, I think this is the right way to put it. This step on the face of it is, is just mistaken, but we don't, the people who make it don't notice the mistake because they're, this is where it comes in that they're like illegitimately smuggling in the ontological proof. So what is the ontological proof? Well, the ontological proof rather than starting with um, the concept of something necessarily existent and then trying to conclude that that thing must be infinitely perfect, right? Which is what we're doing here. The ontological proof instead starts with the concept of something infinitely perfect 
and tries to conclude that it necessarily exists. So the, um, um, actually maybe, well, I guess I'll get to that when I get into it in more detail. I've written down where this proof is in Descartes. Should, um, but, so historically speaking, the ontological proof was invented relatively late. Uh, it was uh, invented by uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury in, I guess, the 10th century. So it's still a long time ago, but it's relatively late compared to the other proofs which uh, are ancient. So, um, but Kant is not, really thinking about St. Anselm's version of the proof. He's really thinking about Descartes' version of the proof. And as I said, Descartes' version of the proof is in the fifth meditation. And it, like, roughly speaking, works like this. Uh, the ens realissimum is the most perfect a thing could possibly be, but it's more perfect to exist than not to exist. So the ens realissimum must exist. Now, like, as soon as you hear that argument, you're like, hold on, something has gone wrong there. And that's exactly what Kant says about it. Actually, it's what Descartes says about it, too, namely that at first you're going to think that. Um, what Kant says about it is that uh, healthy uh, common sense won't accept this argument. And I mean, in a way, Descartes agrees, I think, right? That is, he thinks that from our ordinary common sense point of view, this argument looks like there's something wrong with it. Um, but the difference is Descartes says, but when you look at it carefully from a you know strict philosophical point of view, you'll see that it actually works. Whereas Kant says, and uh, neither does it work from the point of view of careful you know, scientific reasoning or whatever, exactly how he puts it. So, um, so anyway, like I said, it seems like you're getting something from nothing for nothing in this proof. I mean, it doesn't like, it doesn't have any premises. In that respect, it's like the cogito argument basically, but, uh, but Kant thinks, and I guess Descartes thinks too, that the cogito argument is natural. Whereas this one is strained, unnatural. Um, so uh, um, it just starts with a definition, right? Like by God, I mean the most, the, the infinitely perfect being. And then somehow from that, we conclude that the thing I've just defined exists. So it seems like something must have gone wrong, but it's actually, and I think most people who ever uh, examine this proof, that is most philosophers, uh, probably most people too, but anyway, most philosophers who ever examine this proof conclude that there is something wrong with it, but it's not actually that easy to say what's wrong with it. Um, I mean, like, so even in the Middle Ages, after Anselm inv invented it, most of uh, the later scholastics didn't think it was a good proof. Like Thomas Aquinas doesn't think it's a good proof, um, if you know who that is. So uh, um, it was really, it was, it was revived by Descartes. Um, um, but like I said, when people criticize it, they have a hard time explaining exactly what's wrong with it. So Kant is, you know, trying to give his explanation. Um, okay, since, since there are actually two people here, I can ask if there are any questions before I go on. It's not. All right. Okay, yeah, and um, I just, 
so I'm about to go on to talk about the ontological proof in detail. Uh, um, so, I mean, so, sorry, so I should have said this. So Kant says that, like, in historical order, it's true that people came up with this proof first, and then this proof, and then this proof. But he's going to show that this proof was, so to speak, like in the back of their minds all the time. Like they were really, really relying on it, even though if you had brought it out separately and showed it to them, they wouldn't have accepted it. Right. Like it took a long time of getting used to the to, to these arguments before people suddenly like brought this one out by itself. Um, and some people found it convincing. Um Okay, so um, so therefore, Kant says, even though historically speaking, we started with this and then found this and then found this, he's going to go in the opposite order. He's going to discuss this first because then he's going to show that these two really depend on this. So if this doesn't work, these won't work either. Okay, so what is this? Um, Um. Okay, here it is. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of hesitating because I'm trying to find it in Descartes, but I found it. All right. Uh, switch camera. Right, so this is from the fifth meditation, like I said. Descartes says, but if the mere fact that I can produce from my thought the idea of something entails that everything which I clearly and distinctly perceive to belong to that thing really does belong to it. Right, so, what, you know, I, I mean, right, he's saying that, like, if you clearly and distinctly conceive of something and you find that according to your clear and distinct conception of that thing, it has a certain property. So his example is with a triangle. He says, when you clearly and distinctly perceive what a triangle is, you uh, find just in your conception, Kant would disagree with this actually, right? Kant says this is synthetic a priori, but Descartes is saying you find just in your conception of the triangle that it has the property that its angles add up to 180 degrees. And from that, you know that uh, anything that actually is a triangle will have that property because after all, like when you when you think that something is a triangle, all you're doing is thinking that your clear and distinct conception applies to that thing, right? So that's like what, you know, the, the fifth meditation is really overall about restoring the meditator's certainty in mathematical science. Mathematics, basically. Um, uh, so uh, that's what he's been discussing earlier. But then he says, like, oh, but by the way, now that I've explained why we can know certain things for certain about objects because we we derive their properties from our clear and distinct conception of them, he says, is it? Is not this a possible basis for another argument to prove the existence of God? 
Certainly the idea of God or a supremely, per supremely perfect being is one which I find within me just as surely as the idea of any shape or number. Right. So again, Kant says like that part of the sentence there is, I, as, as I understand it, that's already under the influence of uh, dialectical or, or transcendental illusion. That I have the idea of an infinitely perfect thing. Um, but never mind that. So going on with the proof and my understanding that it belongs to his nature, that he always exists, is no less clear and distinct than is the case when I prove of any shape or number that some property belongs to its nature. So, um, he doesn't say exactly why this belongs to his concept of God's nature, but um, I think clearly it's because of what I was saying, namely that um, a non-existent God is less perfect than an existent God, but we're trying to think of the most exist perfect possible things. So it's got to be the one that exists. So existence belongs to my concept of this object. Hence, even if it turned out that not everything on which I have meditated in these past days is true, meaning basically even if it turned out that the third meditation proof doesn't work, I ought still to regard the existence of God as having at least the same level of certainty as I have hitherto attributed to the truths of mathematics. Um, so it, it seems like Descartes actually thinks that the fifth meditation proof is not as good as the third meditation proof. That's kind of a controversial thing to say about Descartes. But in any case, um, right, that he's saying that the third meditation proof makes the existence of God more certain than anything uh, I could know about triangles, for example. And in fact, my knowledge about triangles rests on the fact that, or like the the way I answer my doubts about my beliefs about triangles is by bringing in the existence of God who is not a deceiver as established in the third meditation. So, um, but what he's saying here is, okay, suppose I'm wrong and that kind of certainty is just not available. At least you have to admit the existence of God is as certain as the properties of a triangle, which you're probably still pretty certain of, even though Descartes can give you a reason to doubt it, right? So, um, um, okay, so that's the proof we're talking about. Now, um, or that's almost the proof we're talking about because Leibniz in the monadology and elsewhere, and so Kant can't be thinking about the monadology because it wasn't published in, yet in Kant's time and he didn't see it. But uh, Leibniz, he, he saw it somewhere else in Leibniz or in one of Leibniz's followers. Leibniz objects to, the, uh, to Descartes' version of the ontological proof and says, Look, uh, just because you can kind of give a verbal definition of a thing doesn't mean that uh, you're talking about something possible. So like the example Leibniz gives is the greatest possible speed, which is funny because of course we think there is a greatest possible speed but anyway um he's uh you could substitute the largest possible number or something like that right and he says yeah you can define that concept the greatest possible speed or the largest possible number but uh like there's a hidden contradiction in your concept it's not consistent with a number to be the greatest possible. Every number has a successor, which you can get by adding one to it. So um, if, you, if you assume something actually is the greatest possible number, you will get a contradiction. Um, 
So that's so Leibniz introduces this other step where he says, um, I have to show that the concept of the great, the most perfect possible being couldn't have a, this kind of hidden contradiction in it. And he shows it by saying that different realities can't contradict each other, but the concept of this thing contains only realities and no negations, right? So this is something I talked about last time. Again, Kant thinks there's a, another mistake hidden in there. Um, so with Leibniz's correction, the proof works like this. We say, um, I have this idea of an ens realissimum. Moreover, I know it's the idea of something possible. But if such a thing is possible, it must be actual because um, um, it's part of the concept of infinite perfection that uh, um, that something actually exists. Now, I mean, so by the way, if you ask, like, um, couldn't you use this proof to show that the most perfect possible pizza exists or something like that? Because a pizza that exists is better than a pizza that doesn't exist. Um, so the most perfect possible pizza would be one that exists. Therefore, the most perfect possible pizza exists. But um, you haven't shown that there is no contradiction in the concept of the most perfect possible pizza. In fact, there probably is, right? That is a pizza like a number probably always could be made better in some way. At least it could be made bigger. <laughs> Right, and the bigger the better. Right? So, um, right. So, um, so like that's why when Kant discusses this proof seriously, he um, has the proponents say there's one and only one concept that you can make this argument with, namely the concept of the ens realissimum. But before that, I'm, I mean, because I'm I'm going into this detail because I want to explain why um, Kant first sounds like he's objecting to an argument that obviously no one ever made. Because so before that, Kant like um, forgets about that issue that I was talking about and just takes his opponent to be saying. I've added existence to a certain concept. A certain concept includes existence. And therefore, like uh, um, whatever concept, therefore, whatever is the object of that concept must exist because I said it's an existing whatever, right? So uh, like um, obviously no one has made an argument like that, because you could use it to prove the existence of anything. Um, well, I guess you could say Spinoza has made that argument, and he did use it to prove the existence of everything, <laughs> everything in every possible way. But um, um, yeah, maybe that's exactly what Spinoza does, actually. But if you don't want to say something weird like Spinoza, that you're not going to make that argument because you're going to think that uh, there's plenty of things you can conceive of that don't exist. So, um, so Kant first responds to that. Um, Where is this? Oh, yeah. Yes.
going up here. By the simple device of forming an a priori concept of a thing in such a manner as to include existence within the scope of its meaning, we have supposed ourselves to have justified the conclusion that because existence necessarily belongs to the object of this concept, and leave out this parenthetical remark, we are also of necessity in accordance with the law of identity required to posit existence of its object. Right, let me read that again. Because existence necessarily belongs to the object of this concept, we are also of necessity in accordance with the law of identity required to posit the existence of its object. And this being is therefore itself absolutely necessary. Right, so the argument here is like I've defined something as um, existing. I've included existence in its concepts, right? So like, you know, call this gold plus. The concept of gold was that it's yellow and heavy and soluble in aqua regia. The concept of gold plus is that it's yellow and heavy and soluble in aqua regia, and it exists. Therefore, gold plus necessarily exists. Um, now, I mean, so the reason Kant is discussing this argument, even though, again, obviously the proponents of the ontological proof don't make this argument, um, is that... Um, um, he wants to show in advance the absurdity of the conclusion that something necessarily exists by virtue of his concept alone. That is, that its non-existence involves a contradiction, right? So um, the proof that gold plus exists would be a proof by contradiction. Suppose gold plus does not exist, then something that exists does not exist, contradiction. Ray, like just like the proof that gold plus is um, not non yellow, <laughs> or that gold, let's say the, the proof that, that, and that a given piece of gold plus must be yellow would also be by contradiction. Suppose it's not yellow, then something that's yellow is also not yellow. And that's a contradiction, right? So um, that is, it would be an analytic judgment to say that gold plus exists. Um, so Kant wants to show, Kant like explains in advance that there's no way there could be a contradiction involved in supposing something doesn't exist because to get a contradiction, um, you need um, to deny an analytic judgment. And an analytic judgment, like every judgment, is a rule applied on a condition. Only it's analytic because from the condition itself, you can tell that this rule must apply. So to deny the, to get a contradiction, again, you need to deny such a judgment. You need to deny an analytic judgment. But to deny the judgment, you have to suppose the condition, but deny that the rule applies, right? Like that's what it means to negate a judgment. The judgment only claims anything on a certain condition. 
So you can only negate it by supposing that condition and then saying, but no judgment, what you affirm doesn't hold on that condition. Um, but uh, if you just suppose that um, the person who's making that judgment is not talking about anything, then you get rid of their condition and their rule. So uh, there's no way for a contradiction to be left, right? I'm no longer going along with them and asserting their condition. Um, this is how Kant himself explains it. I don't know if it'll be clearer or less clear than what I just said, but um, this is on B662 and it's on page... Uh, um, 502, and then, oops, no, must have made a mistake here. B6, oh, B622, sorry. Okay. On page 502, in the translation, and that's not right either. Five, oh, sorry, I'm looking at page 504. Here we go, 502. This is, I think, oh, there we go. Uh, okay. If in an identical proposition, an identical proposition is another name for an analytic proposition, right? It holds because of the law of identity. If in an identical proposition, I reject the predicate while retaining the subject, contradiction results, right? That's what I was just saying. I maintain the condition that's in a categorical judgment, at least is the subject of the judgment. But I deny the what is supposed to hold on that condition, namely, again, in a categorical judgment, the predicate. If in an identical proposition, I reject the predicate while retaining the subject, contradiction results. And I therefore say that the former belongs necessarily to the latter. But if we reject subject and predicate alike, there is no contradiction, for nothing is then left that can be contradicted. Right? And he goes on to give an example of, um, you know, the uh, a priori certain, if not, according to him, actually analytic. But anyway, I think he's arguing uh, with Descartes' position here. So like the, according to Descartes, analytic proposition that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Um, uh, uh, in order to contradict it, I need to maintain the condition triangle and reject the rule angles add up to 180 degrees that way i can get a contradiction but if i reject the triangle too uh then uh um there's nothing left to contradict and that's what happens when i say there's no such thing as a triangle Right. If I say there's no such thing as a triangle, then uh, I could be wrong, but it can't be a contradiction. I'm not maintaining anything, which then you can say, but given what you're maintaining, you have to say this, and therefore it's a contradiction. Um, So like that's supposed to show in advance that like, however, this argument is supposed to work, it's not gonna work. And you know, like if you ask, well, what about the case of gold plus? So the point is like, like if this, if gold plus were a legitimate concept that could be the subject of a judgment, 
I mean, I'm not going to say it's not in the end, but if it were, then I can only get a contradiction by saying, like, just like with the case of yellow, that's, I think, why I stumbled when I was trying to give the yellow example. Right? Like, to get a contradiction, I have to say something like, this gold is not yellow. But if I say there's no yellow gold, there's no contradiction there. Right? So like to get the contradiction, I have to posit that the object of the concept exists and then deny something that's in the concept. Right? I have to maintain the condition, then deny something that follows from the condition. So similarly with the case of gold plus, what, you know, if I said, um, this gold plus does not exist, there would be a contradiction because any gold plus that exists contains existence in its concept. Now, I mean, you can already see why existence doesn't belong in a concept, I think, from me talking about this, but like uh, any gold plus that exists has to be yellow and it also has to exist. So if I say this gold plus here, doesn't exist, then there's a contradiction. But if I say um, there is no existent gold plus, that's like saying there is no yellow gold plus. There's no contradiction to it. All I'm saying is that this concept doesn't have an object. So, um, so that, like I said, is, is how we're supposed to be able to see in advance that this argument can't work. But, um, but Kant says, you know, there's a powerful, now I guess this powerful illusion is unnatural or it's unnatural to let it affect us in this way or something like that. So it's not the same as the transcendental illusion, which is perfectly natural. But it is very powerful, Kant says, and um, and it's what makes it seem like the special argument that the ontological uh, proof people actually make makes it seem like hard to say what's wrong with it. And because it really does seem like existence is a perfection. Or in other words, uh, what exists has more reality than what doesn't exist. I mean, you know, because like, if you went down that list of characteristics things can have, like, um, and one characteristic a thing can have is that it exists. So like, if you went down that list and it's supposed to be like separated into ones that imply some reality and some ones that only apply the, imply the absence of some reality, which side is existence going to be on? Well, it's clearly going to be on this side, right? Existence doesn't imply the absence of some reality. So it's going to be somewhere on this list, you might think. And, you know, and um, therefore, like, I don't know about your fancy talk about conditions and rules and whatever, Kant, but, uh, but it's clear that what exists, the existing is having like an extra amount of reality that you wouldn't have if you didn't exist. Um, and so if it's really true that I have a idea of an ens realissimum, right? Like a most real being, There can't be any like extra reality that it's missing. So it must have this one too. So it must exist. Mm. 
but so um Kant just denies that existence could possibly be on that list. This is uh, B628 on page five of the document. Translation five five. By whatever, by whatever, and by however many predicates we may think a thing, even if we completely determine it, we do not make the least addition to the thing when we further declare that the thing is. And um. It's clear that we don't, why? Otherwise it would not be exactly the same thing that exists, but something more than we had thought in the concept. Um, uh, if I'm thinking of something that's yellow and heavy and soluble in aqua regia, I erased that. And then you tell me, Oh, by the way, that exists. Um, well, okay, so let's take a, take, take a different case. So if I say, I'm thinking of something yellow and heavy and soluble in aqua regia, and you say to me, oh, I know what you're thinking of. And by the way, that thing also has this other property, like it's uh, malleable, <laughs> right? So, uh, now uh, you're telling something me something new about what I was thinking about. I was thinking about something yellow and heavy and uh, soluble in aqua regia, and you're telling me, um, you know, it doesn't only have those characteristics, but it also has this other characteristic. Um, suppose it were the same thing with existence. I'm thinking of something yellow and heavy and soluble in aqua regia. And you say, oh, it doesn't only have those characteristics, but it also exists. So now it turns out that what exists is not just what I was thinking about, but what I was thinking about plus this other characteristic, existence. Um, I feel like I felt like that was going to be a clear way to say it, but now I feel like it was a super unclear way to say it. <laughs> um, let me try again using Kant's example, right? Like, suppose I'm thinking of $100, and now you tell me it exists. So, like, if existence is a uh, kind of reality, then the hundred dollars that exists is now less, must be worth like a little bit more than a hundred dollars. Right? Because it has this extra reality that the possible hundred dollars didn't have. But that means that the possible hundred dollars wasn't the possibility of this thing at all. It was the possibility of something less. Right? So like if a hundred um um, actual dollars is worth more than what I was thinking of, then what I was thinking of must have been like only $99.99. .99. Um, but of course, that's absurd, right? I mean, we're talking, we're, we're asking whether the very thing I'm thinking about also exists. So uh, like, um, again, maybe I, I went into this too soon. I wrote it later in my notes. But again, so like that, those are ways of seeing what Kant is trying to get at, namely that he's going to deny this. He's going to say existence is not a perfection. It's not true that what exists has more reality than what doesn't exist. Obviously, it's different in some important way from what doesn't exist. But the way isn't that it has more reality, that there's more to it, that it's more perfect. 
Now, I mean, when I say that last thing, obviously it is important in some different in some important way. I'm saying that like um, Kant, Kant's answer to this is not that you're not saying something about a thing at all when you say that it exists. So, right, so Kant, Kant's view is that existence is not a perfection. What exists? doesn't have more reality than what doesn't exist. What he's not saying is what you sometimes hear these days, although I think it might be less popular than it used to be. Existence is not a predicate. This is what Kant is not saying. So uh, like um, this is, uh... Um, a way of looking at the issue that came out of modern logic, or maybe I should say modern meta logic, or anyway, um, it's and it's I think it's somewhat in the spirit of Kant's response to the ontological proof, but it's really not exactly the same, right? And so, like the way it goes is like if you remember things that you hopefully learned in Phil Nine, like when you say gold is yellow. If you want to translate that into um, predicate calculus, you would say something like this, like let phi be the property of being yellow, and you're saying phi of G, that is G has the property of being yellow. But if you want to say um, something yellow exists, you write it in this completely different way. something that has the property of being yellow exists, right? So this is not uh, a predicate. It's not something that's attributing further features to X. It's a quantifier, um, however you understand what a quantifier is. But um, anyway, so, so that means that like this argument, like when we start talking about existing as something you can say about something, You've already made a mistake, right? Like try to write in this way, gold exists. You can't write it. There's no variable here, right? Like that's just not the kind of thing this notation lets you write. So, I mean, like I said, I think at some time, a lot of people thought that modern logic had, so to speak, proved that, and that that was showed why the ontological proof couldn't work. Um, I think uh, there's no consensus about that anymore, if, if anyone still believes it, right? I mean, people um, will write things like this, something that is gold exists. Um, but uh, people will also say, I'm going to introduce an existence predicate into my logic, you know, and like you can do that. And uh, the situation we're in with mathematical logic now is that like you can do lots of different things and it's just not clear which one you want to. <laughs> So, um, but in any case, like whatever the status of this of, of this argument is, it's not what Kant is saying. Um, um, in fact, Kant claims that the existential is, right? Like if I say gold is, is really the same word as the copula is, like gold is yellow. Where does he say that? This is on uh, B626, and it's on page 504 for translation. Um, um, yeah, I'm so this so this is what Kant actually says. Not being or existence is not a predicate. Being is obviously not a real predicate.
and skipping a little bit, I'm going to come back to what he says in between here. Logically, it is merely the copula of a judgment. The copula, again, is the use of is to combine a subject and a predicate. That's called the copula. Logically, it is merely the copula of a judgment. The proposition, God is omnipotent, contains two concepts, each of which has its object, God and omnipotence. The small word is adds no new predicate, but only serves to posit the predicate in its relation to the subject. If now we take the subject God with all its predicates, among which is omnipotence, and say God is, or there is a God, we attach no new predicate to the concept of God, but only posit the subject in itself with all its predicates, and indeed posit it as being an object that stands in relation to my concept. So what he's saying is that um, when you say gold is, just as when you say gold is yellow, you're talking about the relationship between two objects, the object of the concept gold and the object of the concept yellow. Similarly, when you say gold is, you're talking about a relationship of the concept gold to something. But in this case, it's not another concept. It's you're talking about the relationship of the concept gold to its object. So, um, right, let me so that it, so read the, the last part again. We only posit, posit the subject it's in itself with all its predicates, and indeed posit it as being an object that stands in relation to my concept. Right, so when I say gold is, I'm saying... Um, well, I guess maybe I said it a little bit wrong. When I say gold is yellow, I'm talking about the relationship between these two objects, the object of the concept gold and the object of the concept yellow. I'm saying that this object is, so to speak, part of this. When I say gold is, so I'm talking about this relationship here. When I say gold is, I'm still just talking about a relationship between gold and something else. But in this case, I'm talking about the relationship between gold and the concept gold. Or rather between gold and my concept gold. So, I mean, um, This goes along with what I've been saying all along about the categories of modality or what Kant has been saying all along about the categories of modality. The categories of modality. So remember like the three moments of modality are um, possibility, existence, or sometimes called actuality and necessity. And the concepts of modality, according to Kant, are um, the categories of modality are about the relationship between the subject and the object. So it's actually not just existence that's not a real predicate, neither is possibility or necessity. None of the modal predicates of the categories are real predicates. And like this is exactly what Kant said in um, the postulates of empirical thought. Oops.
So this is B266, and it's on page 239 in the translation. The categories of modality have the pe peculiarity that in determining an object, they do not in the least enlarge the concept to which they are attached as predicates. They only express the relation of the concept to the faculty of knowledge. Relation of the concept. There's a translation issue there. Just say the relation of the object to the faculty of knowledge, but maybe that's what he means by that. But in any case, um, right? So if you look a little bit farther up, this is the postulate of uh, existence or actuality that which is bound up with the material conditions of experience, that is with sensation is actual, right? So to make all of this a little bit more concrete, the claim is that when I say gold exists, I am saying something about gold, but I'm not expressing anything. So if the category of uh, um, quality or quantity, I would be expe ex expressing something about gold internally. With the category of relation, I would be expressing something about gold's relationship to other objects like this, right? And this is a categorical ju um, judgment. And this is a, like substance accent relationship here. Um, so it's one of the categories of relation, but, um, but when I say gold exists, I am saying something about it, but what I'm saying about it is that, um, um, I have sensations that are in accordance with the rule of the concept gold, right? So I'm not adding anything to the rule itself. All I'm all I'm talking about is my the relationship of the object to my rule. And similarly, like if I say, what's the difference in a hundred dollars that exists and a hundred dollars that doesn't exist? They're both worth exactly the same amount. And like in the case of money, like that's the only kind of perfection money can have, right? Like amount. <laughs> So, you know, so they're both exactly a hundred dollars. That's not the difference. What's the difference? A hundred dollars that exists is like um, directly or indirectly causing sensations in me. That is, you know, as Hume puts it, when he talks about how we know about matters of fact, right? Like there has to be a present sensation and from it, I infer the existence of other things. So like maybe I'm looking at my, well, I mean, truth is, so when Kant's talking about $100 or $100, right, it's the same word, $100, um, or $100, when Kant's talking about $100, he's talking about like coins. They actually are somewhere. <laughs> Right. I was about to say something like I'm looking at my account balance on a computer screen and all I see is some pixels. But from that, I infer that the money actually exists somewhere, except the truth is our money doesn't really exist anywhere. <laughs> right? There are no coins. <laughs> There's just more pixels and like whatever, however far you look. But uh, but uh, so I don't know. Anyway, Kant doesn't predict that development of money. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, but like, hopefully if you think of money as coins, then maybe that example can write, like, let's say there's coins somewhere in a box and I'm reading a statement that says how many coins there are. And I infer in various ways from the sensation I'm having now that the coins are there. And that's what I mean when I say they exist. I mean, they're related to my present sensation in the right way.
So like, that's the empirical use of the category of existence. That's what the postulate of existence comes to tell us. How do we apply this category of existence to sensible things? We say they exist if they're related to our actual sensations in the right way. The right way is very complicated, right? As you can tell from the bank account example, but it's, you know, but roughly speaking, we understand it. They, so to, they, so to speak, directly or indirectly cause our present sensations. What about if you're talking about a super, super sensible being that's not a possible object of experience? Now, what do you mean by saying it exists? And the answer Kant says is, we don't know. <laughs> You're trying to apply the categories outside the realm of experience. They don't have a meaning there, right? We have no way of applying them. And that's why the ontological proof is particularly, we feel like there's something wrong with it. Because we know if we were talking about a sensible object, that we would know that the question of whether it exists is never a question of its definition. You're always asking for something that's completely outside its definition or its properties or anything like that, right? You're asking for sensations that are caused by it. Now, someone tries to prove the existence of the ens realismum from its mere possibility. And again, like we're giving Leibniz that, even though that step, step is a mistake as well. We're trying to prove its existence from its mere possibility. And the same thing is true, namely that like nothing in the way we conceive of it could possibly amount to its existence. That would have to be something else. So when we feel there's something wrong, we're right, something has gone wrong. But the problem is we want to say, no, to prove its existence, you have to, but there's nothing to fill in there. Because we don't know what the difference between possibility and existence would be for a noumenon. Just as we don't know what cause and effect would be for a noumenon and so forth. We literally don't know what we're asking for when we ask to prove that a thing like that exists. Um, so that's why like healthy common sense is, um, I didn't write down the place where he talks. Oh yeah, I did, okay. What am I doing for time? Oh, I'm almost out of time. All right, I won't be able to go back to the cosmological proof, I don't think, but hopefully said enough about it. No, I didn't. Well, we'll see if there's time. Let me just read this first. Oops. So this is on B629, and it's on page 506 in the translation. So now here he's talking about the um, existence of an empirical thing. And he's saying, in being thus connected with the content of experience as a whole, the concept of the object is not, however, in the least enlarged. All that has happened is that our thought has thereby obtained an additional possible perception. Right Again, when I said the, the gold exists, I mean, um, uh, I could see it, I could feel it. And I infer that from what I actually am seeing and feeling. It is not therefore surprising that if we attempt to think existence through the pure category alone, we cannot specify a single mark distinguishing it from mere possibility. We don't know what we're adding to possibility 
what existence is supposed to add to the possibility when we try to use the pure category of existence, the unschematized category that doesn't isn't restricted to sensible things. And so like when the ontological proof says for God, possibility is the same as existence. Possibility requires existence. And that um, you can check this if you look back to the Cotswold Marx after the table of categories. Like that's what necessity is. Necessity is existence that follows from mere possibility. So, like when the ontological proof person says the mere possibility of God is no different from the existence of God, in a way they're right. But not because they have some good proof that in this special case, they, you know, possibility implies existence, rather because we just don't know what the difference between possibility and existence is supposed to be at all in this case. Um, and obviously, the right conclusion is not of that, once you realize what's really going on, is not, so we know this thing exists, but rather, so we don't even know what we're claiming when we say it exists, let alone know it exists. Right. We don't even know what that means. Um, so uh, um, a lot more I could say about this, but uh, that's I already took much more time than I had to talk about the ontological proof. But I guess what I want to say uh, in the next three minutes about the cosmological proof is just that. Um, Um, Hawk says the cosmological proof, remember step one was an absolutely necessary being exists. Now, um, Kant says, like, we should stop right there and say, if this proof works, we don't know what it proves the existence of because we have no concept of an absolutely necessary being. We have no concept of an absolutely necessary reason being for the exact reason I've just been talking about. That we have no concept of a being that whose non-existence would be a contradiction. And since we're using pure concepts of the understanding, the only proof of impossibility we could have, right? We can't say it's physically impossible. The only proof we could have is contradiction, but there can't be a contradiction here. So we really don't know what we mean when we talk about an absolutely necessary being. But um um, but we we think we fill something in by saying, oh, but here's a concept, ens realissimum, that um, uh, if there were something like that, it would be absolutely necessary. That, I think, is the way Kant understands this step. So, like, if you tell me this pen is absolutely necessary, Kant says, actually, there's no way of refuting that. Because, again, like, we don't know what absolute, what mysterious quality brings on absolute necessity. It's a complete mystery to us. So I, I could just claim that this pen here is absolutely necessary, that it must exist. And although there's no way I can prove it, there's no way you can refute it either because neither of us really know what we're talking about basically right but um but like what the cosmological proof person does is say oh wait but there's this one concept that we do have that where in the this case we can see how uh, necessary existence would follow from the concept we do understand why it would be necessary so um, so this is the best concept to use for, right? We know we need an absolutely necessary being. Every other concept we have, like we don't see any grounds for absolute necessity in it. But here's one where we do see grounds for absolute necessity in it. So since we have to choose some concept, we should use this one, right? And again, why do we have to choose some concept? Because the supposedly the thesis of the antinomy has shown that there is an absolutely necessary being. So, I mean, um, 
on the one hand, Kant says, of course, the thesis, the antinomy isn't a good proof. So we don't have to choose a concept. So uh, like that part doesn't work. But he, but moreover, he says, if it were really true that this one concept, the concept of the ens realissimum is something that we can see the grounds of necessary existence in, well, then that would be the ontological proof. And the whole cosmological part would be unnecessary, right? Just say, we can see the grounds of necessary existence in this concept and you're done. It must, ex the thing must exist. Um, so that's why he says, as he puts it, that the co cosmological proof, the ontological and cosmological proof are like two witnesses to something. They're both witnessing to the existence of God, right? And we think that having both of them is better because we have two independent witnesses. Here's a proof that works with mere concepts, and here's a proof that starts with an empirical datum. Something exists. That would be the cosmological proof. But he says, in fact, it's just the same witness who like went out and like changed clothes and appearance and came back in because <laughs> it's really the ontological proof working in the cosmological proof too. Okay, that is all I have time to say. Um, thank you for uh, attending and or watching this course on video. Um, and uh, I won't have more office hours after this, but if you want to meet me, just let me know. And, you know, to talk about the final assignment or anything else, just let me know and we can make an appointment. Okay, thank you. Bye.